Welcome to Inside Analog Photo. I'm your host, Scott Shepard, and the Inside Analog Photography Radio Program is brought to you by Fujifilm, making life more colorful. they got bright black and white, C41 color neg, chrome, and, of course, Instax in the country. Really fun instant photography. Check it out, www.fujifilmusa.com forward slash professional, making life more colorful. Our friends over at Richard Photo Lab, a great place to send all of your films to be developed, scanned, a lot of great stuff going on with Brian and Bill and all the cool guys over there. Check them out, www.richardphotolab.com. Our friends over at DR5 for black and white chrome. Unbelievable what you can do with black and white when you have it turned into chrome. It's beautiful work. Check them out, www.dr5.com. And our friends over at Upstrap at upstrap-pro.com for the camera strap that will not let your camera slide off your shoulder. Great stuff. And, of course, our media partners are the Analog Photography User Group over at www.apug.com. Dot org. we got a great show today. We're going to have with us Daniel Milner. Daniel is a professional photographer out of Orange County, California. He's doing some great work. There's really cool stuff going on with Daniel, and we just want to talk to Daniel today and, of course, find out what he's up to, how he got in photography, and all this great stuff that he's up to. Daniel, how are you doing today? I am doing great. Thank you for having me. Thanks for joining us here on Inside Analog Photo. Daniel, Tell our listeners about yourself as a photographer. How'd you get into photography? Let's talk about Daniel here for a moment so people can get acquainted with you. Well, basically, I started out as a country boy. I was raised in Indiana, Wyoming, in the country, and photography for me started basically with my mom. My mom was a, an avid photographer, so growing up, I have an older brother and older sister, even though I'm by far the best of the three. But I do have an older brother and sister, but my mother would photograph all of us all the time. So the idea of a camera being around was pretty much instilled in me as far back as I can remember. So it was an easy transition for me. When the idea of actually taking pictures came along, it was something that was actually somewhat natural. So you're sort of the generation of Generation Digital, I guess, to a point. So let's talk about when you started shooting with your mom and your family, what did you use gear-wise? Well, I remember the first camera I ever had was a Vivitar point-and-shoot with a built-in flash. I don't remember the model name, but I remember getting it. It was either for Christmas or for my birthday one year. And I was really small because what I remember about the photos were two things. One, the perspective was from a very low angle, which was actually kind of funny. And the second was, it's actually become a little bit more relevant lately because of what I'm doing currently, but I immediately began to put together little books of photographs, which I'm still doing today, but on a much, I guess, higher end level. But I got that Vivitar and I just shot like crazy. Very cool. So you started off your photography in film. Tell me where things progressed from there. You had the Vivitar when you were a kid. Did you do photography in high school? Did you have the darkroom experience in high school? Where did you go from there? No, I didn't touch a camera in high school. I had the Vivitar, and then the Vivitar, I think, finally broke, or I lost it, or something happened to it, and I didn't have a camera for years and years. On a strange side note, I do remember getting the high school yearbook photographer in trouble in one of my classes, and I can't remember what I did, but that was my only thing to do with high school photography was getting him in trouble. But it wasn't until I graduated from high school, I went into the summer school at sea program, which was a merchant marine program out of Texas A&M at Galveston. And there was a guy on the ship that was a photographer who was the official photographer of the ship, and I can remember watching him working as we were in these places. We went to South America and through the Caribbean, and I can remember him and watching him work. And it was the first time I think I ever really was around a photographer who kind of knew what they were doing on more of like a professional scale. So I went back to Texas. I was planning on going to school to study geology. And there was a problem with the school that I was planning on attending, and they lost my admission records. And they said, look, it's our fault. We lost your records. You're going to have to wait a semester before you come here. So it was very last minute. I was stuck. I had nowhere to go except for the local community college was still open. And I thought, well, I'll go to this school, I'll take some basic classes, and then when the semester's over, I'll transfer into the original school that I plan to go to. And during that time, I started digging around in a closet at home, and I came across a Ricoh SLR camera that I think my brother had been given for Christmas or something. And nobody would ever used it. It had been stuck back in this closet. And I dug it out, and I was thinking back to that photographer on the ship, and I thought, you know what, I'm going to carry this around and see what I can come up with. And I stumbled into South Texas had a flood. I was at a low water crossing, and there was a school bus full of kids that were about to be swept away, and I started shooting pictures. And I went back to the community college a couple weeks later, and I was just going through classes, and I showed those photos to someone. This person knew the head of the journalism department, 
he showed the photos to the journalism department, and the journalism instructor said, hey, if you want a scholarship to be a photographer, I'll give you a scholarship. And that was it. And I never went to school for geology, and within two weeks I knew that photography was what I was going to do. So where did that carry over from when you got out of school? Did you continue photography for fun? Tell me about where Daniel progressed from there in Galveston to your next evolution in your photography history here. Well, I immediately started working for newspapers. I had a vision of what I wanted to be as a photographer, but I had no idea how to get there. I still actually feel that way today. I thought I wanted to be a newspaper photographer at least for a while, but the goal that I had was to be a magazine photographer. And so I basically got on a path, or what I thought was a path, to do that. So I ended up transferring from the little community college. I ended up going to photojournalism school at the University of Texas in Austin. And I spent three years there, graduated, I believe, in 1992. And then after graduation, I started working for newspapers. Did the newspaper thing, did the magazine thing, and then transitioned to a whole bevy of other jobs, which leads me up to today. Some people might know you, Daniel. You used to work for Kodak. You've done some other things within the industry. Tell me about your involvement after you sort of, I think, left the photojournalistic realm and your transition between then and what you're doing now. Okay. I worked for newspapers for about a year and a half, and then I left and started freelancing or trying to freelance for magazines because that's what I thought I really wanted to do. And at the time, there were certain routes that you took to go from being a newspaper photographer to a magazine photographer. So I did that, and I made the rounds in New York and showed my book around, and I ended up freelancing for about four years but what I realized was that I was spending a lot of time doing assignments that really weren't producing the kind of work that I wanted to produce, with the idea being that I would make my living shooting these assignments and then I would take the income and go work on my own projects. But what I realized was that that was, one, extremely difficult to do, and two, it just wasn't working for me. I was working for these publications and doing assignments that I thought, this just really isn't my cup of tea. And along about that time, Eastman Kodak Company had a job opening in Southern California for somebody to basically be a liaison between Kodak and the photographers in Southern California. And so my wife knew some people at Kodak, called around and found out about what the job was, and so I applied for this job. Oddly enough, Kodak actually hired me. And I think there were some people there that really wanted to hire me and some people there that were like, no way, we're not going to hire a photographer. But they ended up hiring me, which was great. So for the next four and a half years, I was a liaison for Kodak in Southern California. Ironically, this was a really positive time for me as a photographer. In fact, I just wrote something on my blog yesterday about this very fact. During the time I worked for Kodak, I had to sign a conflict of interest letter stating that I wouldn't do assignment work in the professional field because it was a conflict of interest with the clients that I had at Kodak. So during the time I worked there, the only camera I owned was a Leica rangefinder, and the only pictures I took were pictures of my own projects. They were all the things that I wanted to photograph. So every time I picked up a camera, I was never doing work for anyone else. I was only doing my style of photography. So I was with Kodak for about four and a half years, and I think during that time I produced probably the best documentary work or some of the best documentary work I've ever done. And it really taught me that you don't necessarily need to be a photographer to be a photographer as long as you're producing the work. But I knew that Kodak was never going to be a long-term solution for me. It was just something that I wanted to do. I wanted to experience that and learn what it was like to work for a corporation. And then in, I want to say, 2001, I left Kodak. I just quit and went back to being a photographer full-time. Actually, how cool would it be to get paid for four years to be able to work on your own stuff? It was unbelievable. It spoiled me because when I left Kodak to go back into photography, I did the same thing that I was doing before, but I chose a different field. I went into wedding photography and at the time, the wedding industry was very different than it is today. But I went into weddings with the idea that I would make my income from doing weddings and then take that income and finance my own projects. And for the first five years after I left Kodak, that worked really well. And then I just started to get tired of shooting that many weddings, even though I was never a real high-volume person. I really tried to do as few as I could and then make each one as unique as I possibly could. I shot weddings in a very different way than the mainstream wedding world, which I still do as well. I think for 9 out of 10 people in that world are probably not good clients for me, but that 1 out of 10 is fantastic. And so that was sort of my model from the beginning. My level of personal work actually started to sort of drop off again when I went into that because I think it's very misconceiving how difficult it is to do documentary work and the time it takes and the research and the time in the field, and it's tricky. 
it's incredibly fun. That's the work that I like to do the most, but it's also the most difficult to do. So let's touch on, I guess, Daniel, what you like to shoot. Of course, you had the camera when you were a kid. What are you using now? What do you like to shoot with? Let's talk about gear. Ah, uh, let's talk about gear. Well, in some ways, I'm a secret gearhead, but I'm also very minimal in terms of the gear that I use. Up until now, the digital equipment that I've used has 99% of it has been Canon, obviously. But I think Canon was on top of the digital game really from the beginning, also meeting Amy and being around that equipment. But for film, typically I use three different things. I use a Leica rangefinder for 35 millimeter. That's a camera that in the history of photography is one of, if not the most significant camera in history. Sure. Now, are you uh, using an MP, an MP7, MP4, 5? What is your flavor that you like to enjoy in the Leica category? Well, I have an admission to make. I, I do. <laughs> or you're a junkie. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I make really stupid mistakes from time to time, or poor decisions, I should say. I got my first Leica in about 1990, which was an M4P, which I bought at a camera store in San Antonio. I took my savings in there, and I dumped it on a 28mm and a Leica M4P, which was probably the best Leica I ever had. The M4P was made, I think, back in the 60s or 70s. No meter, all mechanical, unbelievable camera, which I then, in one of my poor decisions, ended up years later selling. The camera that I have right now is an M6, which is actually not that old. I think this one was made in 1997. This is my third M6, and I sold the first two. Again, repeating those poor decisions, but I'm finally back to the Leica, and I use a 35 F2, a spheric lens. That's the primary lens, and if I had my druthers, I would have a second body, preferably an older one. I would love to have an M2 or M3 with a 50 millimeter, which I'm sure I'll have in the next year or so. I really like to work with two bodies when I'm in the field so that I don't have to change lenses, mm -hmm. and if something happens or a broken or stolen or whatever then I have a second body to go to. So eventually I'll get a second body. And I love the idea of a camera that's really old, that has no meter. I love the old style rewind cranks. I love everything about those old cameras. And the old cameras were also made from brass, so they're a little bit different feeling than the camera like an M6, which is made from a different material. So hopefully within before long I'll have my second one. There you go. And you're not lusting after a Noctilux 50.95 or a 1.0, or is that... A too shallow depth of field, and you like to have stuff more wider, deeper, or is it just a fact that they're just way overpriced and very expensive? Well, there's two reasons. I love shallow depth of field, so that's not a problem. I love the idea. It wasn't until recently that I even knew that Leica had a .9 lens. I didn't know that anybody in the history of photography had ever made that. It actually kind of threw me for a loop there for a minute when I found out. But for me, it's two things. One price, definitely. That's probably a five or $6,000 lens. But two, it's also about the size and the weight. And the beauty of the Leica is that it's so small, it fits in the palm of your hand, and it's a very unobtrusive camera. You can make pictures with that camera that you can't make with anything else. And when you're doing documentary work and you walk in somewhere, a new scene or a new scenario, and you're carrying that, it's so easy to work as opposed to carrying a big SLR or a big lens where it sort of stamps you as the photographer. But Leica makes a 51.4, which would be really nice. But I would even be happy with the 50 F2. I mean, that's a great lens. It's really sharp, and it's also very small. In fact, I was with another photographer yesterday who uses that lens, and I played around with it a little bit, which, going back to my bad decisions, I actually owned a 51.4 like 10 years ago, which I don't have anymore. But I'll probably end up getting the F2, if I had to guess. Very, very cool. So before we get into the whole theory of the Leica and the small camera and being the fly on the wall deal, Let's talk about the rest of your gear. So are you okay. sporting any Canon 1V HSs? What's going on with your Canon gear? I do have a Canon 1V that I've had forever. And um, it's funny, that camera, it's come up a lot recently. David Burnett, the photographer on his blog, was writing about that camera a couple of days ago in a really fantastic post. I have it, and I've had it forever, and it works great. The 1V is one of those cameras that it was so good at the time and we sort of took it for granted because their cameras, and even at the time, you know, the Nikon, the F5s and stuff, those were such good cameras. And then when you put it away for a couple of years and don't use it, then you go back to it and pick it up and use it, you realize, holy cow, this thing for 1200 bucks or whatever it was, it was an unbelievable camera. So I still have that, and I do use it for my kids' work when I shoot portraits and when I want to shoot film 35. And I also use the Hasselblad a lot and the Fuji 6x9. And which Fuji 6x9 do you have? I have the Fuji 6x9 rangefinder with, with the 30, well, I'm trying to think of what, uh, 
I you have, you, you have the 690 regular with removable lens, the 692 or the 3, and you have the SW probably the super wide. I don't have the super wide. I have the normal lens, and it's the 693. Ah, 693 with a 90 millimeter Fujian lens, yeah. f3.5. Yeah. Beautiful yep. camera. Those are absolutely fantastic. It's gigantic, but it's actually not that heavy. No, yeah. no, I love that. I have a 692. It's one of those sleeper cameras. I think it came out at a sort of strange time, and a lot of people missed it. I know I did. I didn't even know anything about it until I saw a couple of books done by photographers in New York. And I have another photographer friend in Miami who uses it. And I saw their images, and I was just blown away and said, what did you do these on? And it's sort of like, if you're used to using a Leica, it's the same concept, just with a giant body. It's the rangefinder, works the same way, no meter, really basic, but holy cow, does it make a nice negative. Six by nine is just huge. It's great. You it's can't great. beat it. The bigger the negative, the better. Eight by ten, if you could walk around with a monster rangefinder. <laughs> yeah, I would try it. Yeah. Why not? So you're pretty much in the rangefinder gig except, of course, the blood. The blood, and the blood is a big part of what I do. I kick myself. I should have bought a Hasselblad 20 years ago. There was something in the back of my head from the day that I started shooting pictures. The first time I saw square imagery, I said to myself, that's something I need to do. And it took me 15 years to figure it out. Luckily for me, I finally got into Hasselblad after the bubble burst. I think I paid 165 bucks for my first Hasselblad. And it's a camera that I still have and use all the time. I have two of them now, but the Hasselblad to me, the square and the, how that system works and the look, that's my primary goal with my portraiture is to shoot that camera. Are you using a 500, a 503? Which one are you using? What do you like? I have, two. I have a 500CM Yep. and I have a 503CW. And do you like one better than the other for any reason or do you like the 500 better than the 503? Well, I think for nostalgia reasons, I like the 500 because it's really old and it's the first one I got. It's old, it's banged up, and I've had it the longest. But the 503 is a nicer, newer, cleaner camera, so I've sort of switched over to the newer one. And if I'm not mistaken, I think the 503CW takes some of the new digital back. Not that I've ever put one on there, but I could hypothetically if I needed to. For what I shoot, there's not really that much application for that. Okay, so let's go to emulsions. Let's go to films. So we know what you like to shoot for gear, and we'll get back into, I think, some of the gear thoughts here after a while. But let's talk about stock. Now, you used to work for Kodak. Are you in love yes. with Kodak film? Do you like Fuji stuff? Do you always shoot black and white? you shoot in color? What's up with your emulsion? What are you shooting? Well, I did work for Kodak for a long time, so I definitely have a soft spot for Kodak. But even during the time that I worked for Kodak, I try to be as honest as possible with photographers. The short answer is everybody makes really good film. And I think from the time that I started in photography till now, the emulsion choices that we have and the improvements in film, they're just light years beyond where they were when I started. But I'm definitely a Kodak photographer. For the black and white, for years and years and years, I shot mostly Tri-X, except for 35 millimeter. A lot of the projects I've done have all been with the TMZ, the T-Max 3200, which I still use a lot. And Tri-X to me is the most forgiving Probably, in my mind, it's probably the most historical film in the history of photography. I think there have been more interesting images done on that than anything else, so I still use Tri-X. But recently, Kodak reformulated their T-Max film, and they shipped me some of the 400, and I did a portrait shoot with it somewhat by accident. I actually had taken it out of the packaging and accidentally put the T-Max rolls in with my bag of Tri-X, and I was in the middle of a shoot, and I was going really fast, and I finished with a roll, and I rewound and went to lick the film and realized I just shot T-Max instead of Tri-X. And I thought, oh boy, hope that comes out right. And I'm very glad I did because the result was really fantastic. I realized that the reformulation sort of fit the look of exactly what I was going for with the films. So now I shoot a lot of 120 T-Max and 35 Tri-X and TMZ. So let's talk about your T-Max and the Tri-X. Are you shooting both these at four, at two? What do you like to do your portraits at? What do you like to shoot your TMZ at? What do you expose your black and white with? I guess you're not using a lot of color, no? Well, occasionally, Kodak has a new Ektar 100. Isn't that tasty? It's nice. I mean, it's really amazing. And oddly enough, about, I don't know, six months ago, I don't remember what I shot or why, but I actually shot a roll of color transparency just probably because I had it and I was messing around. And holy cow, did that look good, too. It had been years and years since I shot a roll of slide film, and it looked so fantastic. Not that I'm going to go back and shoot a lot of slide film, but it did look really good. All my color neg is Portra. I typically use the 160 or the 400, and it's either NCVC depending on the look that I'm going for. But 
All the negative films, if it's 400, I'll overexpose it, so I'll rate it at 320 or 250, depending on what the light is. The T-Max film is a mysterious creature that can really be exposed anywhere from 800 to 25,000, but I typically rate it at 1250 and process it normal because the true film speed isn't 3200. It's slower than that. And so what I do is I just rate it at 1250 and then I process it normal and it tends to be right on the money. What are you using for light meter stuff? Are you always have a meter in your pocket? Are you just guesstimating on things based off experience? What do you like to use to meter your stuff with? Well, I do have a handheld meter. I use a very, very small Siconic. It's actually very inexpensive. It's smaller than a pack of cigarettes. Little handheld meter that I use when I'm shooting the Leica or the Hasselblad. The little L208. Uh, I believe so. It's not in front of me at the moment. A little analog one, yeah. Yeah, it's super basic. I mean, you can plug strobes into it, but I don't own strobes anymore. But it's just a tiny little ambient reader. And I use it always when I'm with the Blot or the Leica. That basically is it. However, if you're good, you don't need the meter, especially when you shoot the same film all the time. You should be able to, as a photographer, look and read the scene. And in fact, I was with another photographer yesterday who shoots Leica, and he had driven down here to hang out. He didn't even have a meter with him. He said the same thing. If you use the same film enough, you should be able to look around and know exactly what the light is. I think it's a really good exercise for a photographer to do that. In fact, I was shooting in New Mexico two months ago, and the meter in my camera died, but the camera still worked without the meter. And I was literally in the middle of this sort of fast-moving thing, and I had to say to myself, okay, what's the light? I need to know what this is. I learned to do that early on and back in the newspaper days because I shot the same film every single day for several years, and I knew that film inside and out, and I knew light inside and out. And I think, like you said, if you shoot enough and you know one thing, you should be able to nail it eventually. You're going to be able to say, well, you know, that looks like 125th at F4. Cool. Yeah, and you get really crazy, and you can see where the light's changing, and you're like, well, that half of the frame is 250 F8.5, and then the other half is a 60th at 4, and you know where you're going to be, where you need to be to get the part of the negative that you want, and it all happens in a millisecond with barely any thought required because you're so in tune to the light and what you're doing. It just comes from repetition. Nowadays, there's new equipment all the time, so it's very rare that you spend three, four, five years with the same piece of equipment because it's turning over all the time. And for me, I like the old stuff. I don't have to worry about changing it or upgrading it. I need to be really familiar with the equipment because to me, any piece of equipment, you should never have to think about it. The good equipment, you never have to look at, you never have to think about. It's just an extension of your hand or your vision or whatever you want to call it. I know that when I test out new cameras today, it's kind of funny because you're clunking around with them in the field. You don't know where the buttons are and it's like working with an arm tied behind your back until you get things figured out. So true. Daniel, are you processing your own black and white? Are you doing everything yourself in-house? Are you shipping it out? What are you doing after your capture? Well, that's a really good question and a timely one because right now I use a lab for everything. They process my film, they make contact sheets, and then they scan every single image high res at the time of process. What lab are you using? I use Richard Photo in L.A. Fine sponsor of the Inside Analog radio program, Brian and those guys, and yeah, you can't Mr. go Brian, wrong. It, the thing about Richard Lab is that they basically specialize in people exactly like me. The great thing about the city of L.A. is it's sort of a rarity. It's a city that has a lot of really good photo lab. So, for example, I also use A&I Photo Lab because A&I has the Ilford digital silver process for printing large silver prints that are bigger than what I can do traditionally. And nobody else has that machine. And a lot of cities' labs have gone away, or they have one lab that sort of specializes in the commercial world of photography. But there's a subset of photographers that I sort of belong to, which is when I go to do a shoot, I'm not a really heavy shooter. I don't go out with the idea of massing as many pictures as I possibly can. And the other thing is that most of the pictures that I shoot, I need to use. So if I shoot 200 images... It's not like I'm editing a portrait in a studio where if I shoot 200, I might pull four or five images and use those. If I shoot 200, I probably need 185 of those pictures. And so Richard Lab specializes in that, and that's why I can go in there and get really high-res scans that look fantastic of each individual frame, because that's what a lot of their photographers are doing. Now, do you find that with Richard, everything's what you want? You said there's a timely question here involved. Are you thinking about doing your own stuff? Because... Of course, doing black and white is much easier to do yourself than it is doing an E6 process or even a C41. So what's your thoughts about Daniel bringing stuff in-house? Well, I have mixed thoughts. For jobs that I'm doing, for portraiture and for other kind of jobs, 
I'm definitely going to use Richard Lab. There's two things. One, I miss processing my own black and white film. I love processing. And the second thing is, for some unknown reason, which I really can't explain, I actually like scanning. And scanning is very slow, and it's kind of mind-numbing. For whatever reason, most people hate scanning. But for me, I actually kind of like it. So I'm contemplating only for my projects, processing my own film again, and also making my own scans, which is obviously just for the digital side. About six months ago, I went back in the darkroom after a 15-year break. And again, it's sort of like selling my first light guy. I made. That was a very bad decision. And ever leaving the darkroom was also a bad decision. And so I've really stumbled into the darkroom again and really want to spend as much time in there as possible. So processing film, when you're going to be there making prints, it's sort of a natural part of that process is to do everything yourself. And so I can see in the next couple of months, I'm trying to look for a scanner, and I think I'll be processing my film again. I really love doing that, and there's so much more that you can do. A lab like Richard, they have to keep in mind what the base of their clients are looking for. So you can't go to a lab like that and say, hey, I want to process in Rodinol 1 to 60 at 85 degrees. They're just not going to do that. They'd go out of business if they were trying to do that. But as an individual, you can really fine-tune your work. Have you ever had anything done by David Wood, the guys at DR5 that do black and white chrome? I don't know if you've seen this process before, but it's quite interesting. I've seen it, and I was at Kodak when they came out with it. It's a great process, and it's a unique look. I've personally never done any film that way. Not that I wouldn't do film that way. It's just I get in my little ruts where it's the TMZ and the Tri-X in my system, and I get obsessed with actually taking the photos and probably don't experiment enough on the backside. But... In fact, I just saw something about DR5 a couple of weeks ago, and it reminded me of my time at Kodak and visiting those guys in L.A. Yeah, it's quite an interesting process. You're going to look for your own scanner. What are you looking for for a scanner? Are you looking for like an Epson 750M? You can wet mount your stuff. Are you looking to go a little more high-end with an Imicon, or are you going to go for a drum scanner? Because Uh, I'm sure your stuff down at Richard's being done on either a Fuji SP2500 scanner. they got a couple, three different ones, but they're all production line scanners. Are you looking to get a production scanner or something that you can take it to the next level? No, I'm going to torture myself. I'm not going for a production line scanner. And I think that's what Richards is using. They are definitely production scanners. They just happen to do a really nice job. But I am not looking for that. If I had my choice, and this is my one cry for help plug, I've always wanted an Imicon scanner. The problem is, Imicon scanner, as you know, you can either buy a house in California or you can buy an Imicon scanner. They're actually really expensive. And with everything else that I'm currently buying, there's no way I can buy an Imicon scanner. But that would be by far my number one choice. I don't really want a drum scanner, and I don't want to wet mount my stuff. I have done that before, and it's just a little bit too labor-intensive. So if you don't get the Imicon, your choices are very limited. And the Epson, again, for the price point, I think that's a pretty good scanner. But I tend to prefer dedicated film scanners. And really, the other option that floats around is the Nikon 9000. And the Nikon 9000 has the holders that come with it, but it's also available with a glass mount holder. And so I'm contemplating what to do, if that's the route that I want to go or something else. I honestly don't know. Someone needs to commission you to do a little bit of work for them so you can go buy an Imicon. There you go. That's the thing. A wedding or two or a commercial job or two or the Richard Branson family portrait, any of those (laughs) would probably do. Exactly. Or maybe whoever owns Imicon, I should shoot their family portrait. There you go. Our friends from Hasselblad, yeah. Maybe the United Nations can commission Imicon to start a sponsorship program. They should. Everybody needs one. I want one. (laughs) They're fantastic. I mean, they're beautiful machines. The way that they operate and the holders and everything, they're fantastic. They're They're very close to a drum. I mean, yes, you can get a better scan out of a drum, but get to the point to where, okay, well, you're pushing your limits. I guess it depends on your output. I mean, if you're shooting six by nine and you want to make it the size of a billboard, well then I guess you have a drum scan, and if you're shooting 6x9 and you want to make some 4x6 proofs, well, you could probably use a $40 scanner from Office Depot. So Exactly, and for me, it's just to be able to make, when I print digitally, I want a really nice scan. But I'm not somebody that the modern trend in exhibiting photography is to make prints that are just the size of billboards. And I'm not a huge believer in that. I think some work looks really good. I love the size of 16x20, 20, 20x24. 20 that, to me, is a really perfect size for showing work. With an Imicon, you can make scans that are absolutely fantastic for that size. So that's really, for me, all that I would be looking for. And the small prints I farm out, those are all done at the labs. But anything over 11 by 14, I print myself. So let's talk about that. So you have your workflow done by Richard. 
you go back and you see Brian or Bill or somebody at the counter, they give you your goodies, you go back to the house, back to the studio. You're a hybrid artist like everybody that's shooting film these days, so now you've gone into a digital environment. Are you categorizing all your stuff in Lightroom? Are you using Aperture, using Photo Mechanic? What do you use to put your images together so you sort of know what you have? I have all the above, but the first (laughs) thing I do is I go to Richards. Milton is, is one of the guys that I work with a lot at Richards. And Steve is another, and my first thing at Richards is to torment them because they're Dodger fans, and I'm a Seattle Mariner fan. So I have to get in, I get my cracks in on the Dodgers, and then I quickly grab my film and leave. But I do, I've been working in the digital sort of workflow for, I mean, years. It's probably at least 12 years. So the film comes in, and then everything goes into the sort of digital pipeline. And for the past few years, I had an online archive with Digital Railroad, who is no longer with us. And I had all my images online and keyworded, high res, and I was able to basically have access to them because I would get calls from book publishers and magazines looking for work, and so I'd be able to have instant access to them. But my workflow was a little bit, I guess you could say, lo-fi. I have Aperture, I have Lightroom, I have CS3, I haven't moved to CS4 yet, but with what I do with Photoshop, it's not really critical that I move that fast. But I also had iView Media as well, which I was using for my cataloging program. And the other programs were fine, but I found them a little bit difficult to use for cataloging. And so iView I kept around because it was really simple to use, which I believe iView is now called Expression Media. Yep, Um, Microsoft bought them, and now it's something that's wrapped into some bundle, yeah. Yeah, which is a little bit worrisome. When software programs go away and you have your catalog with them, it makes you a little (laughs) weenish. Yeah, I guess so. (laughs) But I use Lightroom, and I also use Aperture as well, but I use them for different reasons. And the problem that I have with all these different softwares is I just wish that there was one that did everything I needed to do. And currently, there isn't one. Not only do I live a hybrid life shooting film and then importing the stuff, digitizing everything, but then I also use about a half a dozen different programs to get done what I need to get done. And so today, I was actually working on some film files, and I did the whole thing in Bridge and Photoshop because I just need to make a quick edit, pull images, dodge and burn them, and then send them off. And so that was all done. But yesterday when I tested the Sony, I was using Lightroom. Very, very interesting. So your work, do you shoot more for stock? Do you like to do more commission? Is it just Daniel's going to go out and shoot whatever you think is cool, and then you're going to figure out what to do with it later? What's your process behind why you're going to go shoot something? Well, it depends on whether it's a personal project, my work, or it's for commission. With my portraiture, I prefer to do two things. The best for me is to get people to commission me to photograph their kids. That's what I love to do. And that allows me to shoot basically any way that I want to shoot. I can use any format, any camera, any style, black and white color, etc. I prefer to shoot the Hasselblad and black and white and make pictures that are my favorite way of working. But in the stock world, the black and white square picture is not exactly what sells the most. So when I do pictures for stock, I have to keep other things in consideration. Color is a far more viable medium, our choice to make when you're shooting, and also the different formats. So when you ask earlier if I shoot digital, the one thing that I've realized for me makes a lot of sense is when I shoot pictures of kids specifically for stock, digital makes a lot of sense because you have a very limited time with these kids and you're trying to basically produce a wide range of images in a very short period of time. And they can hypothetically be color, black and white, etc. although I never convert my stock pictures from color to black and white. I basically just leave them all color. But the commission work is what I prefer to do, stock in addition to that. But with my documentary work, that's really the only work that I do completely on my own, and then I figure out stuff to do with it later. I haven't really gone after commissions to do documentary work in probably 10 years. I don't really do magazine work anymore. I don't even look for magazine work. And the reason for that was that so much changed in the photo business from the time that I started until now. I made a realization probably seven or eight years ago that I was spending so much time and energy and money trying to get magazines interested in what I wanted to do that I realized if I just take the same time and money and energy and go do the project on my own, one, I'm a lot happier, and two, I can spend longer in the field and I can shoot the way that I want without anybody putting parameters on me. So if I want to shoot Leica with T-Max 3200 and spend three weeks in the field, I can do it. And at the end, what I realized was the only thing that really mattered was the work. And I was producing better work on my own than I was while I was doing assignments. And so I still do the same thing today. I dream up the project, and I finance it myself, and I go and do it. And it could be two days, or it could be two years. 
it just depends on the project. That's cool, though. You get to do what you want. And people are hiring you to do these commissions on the portraits, and you get to play with this other type of gear, and you actually get to shoot what you want and not what you have to to just get the job done. Because as you well know, a lot of guys that are chasing editorial and all this other stuff, they're stuck shooting digital or this thing because they have to turn it in a half hour, and just you're tied into a certain deal. Great to see your work to be able to be somewhat free. Yeah, I mean, I feel very, very fortunate for two reasons. One is I stumbled into photographing kids. Fifteen years ago, you asked me if I'd be shooting kids, I would have said no way. And it was just basically a neighbor with two kids that asked me if I would photograph them. And this was a couple of years ago. And I said, well, I don't really photograph kids. Just let them come over to the house, and then I'll just hang out with them. And I made some pictures, and then she saw the photographs and then started telling all her friends, and it went from there. But I feel so lucky to have stumbled into that because I absolutely love photographing kids. I love kids. I don't have any. But I'm really immature, and I'm very irresponsible, so I have a connection with them, and I absolutely love it. And for the documentary work is what I think about at night before I go to sleep, and it's the first thing I think about when I wake up in the morning, because that's really, for me, what I got into photography to do. And it's a very strange thing when you're doing that work, but you're under the parameters that someone else has put on you. It changes a lot of things. And I know that that's a struggle that a lot of photographers have, that are doing editorial or are working for other clients that sort of say, yes, we want you to go here and do this project, but you have to use digital and you have to transmit and you have to do this and that. Then I think what happens is the work always gets compromised. And you can see that. And I think that's one of the reasons why there's been such a huge homogenization of photography, especially in that field. We see unbelievable numbers of pictures and most of them look exactly the same. And they're not really that well thought out or they're not really that well planned but they're immediately in front of us. And I never wanted to get roped into doing that because for me, the ability to do documentary work was always a very sacred thing. I mean, that to me is the prize in my photographic life is to be able to spend time in the field doing that. Yeah, and I think back to your point that you got to that everything looks the same. The problem is they don't teach photographic education really in schools anymore. People go out and buy a digital entry-level kit camera and point it somewhere. Unless you're a complete fool, you're going to get a pretty good image. The deceiving thing is that photography is equated with the technology. I think it's always been that way in photography. There's always been that certain gear associated with the professional. When people have always thought, well, if I just buy that piece of equipment, I mean, I can remember myself looking through the catalog of camera equipment when I first decided I really want to buy a camera. And I'm flipping and flipping and flipping, and all of a sudden, there's the page of professional equipment. And it looked different, and it was priced different, and it had this sort of exotic look and feel to it. And I thought, wow, I don't really know why, but I know that's what I want. I'd never had any kind of training. I didn't know about light and timing and composition and all that. And I think today you see the same thing, but magnified a hundred times over. The level of professionalism is associated with equipment. And the idea of learning photography gets completely lost. It's just, hey, if you have a 5D Mark II and a PowerBook and Aperture, whatever software, and Photoshop, guess what? You're a photographer. It's a weird thing. It's terrible for the professional. But on the flip side, I think the cool thing about the digital revolution and all this stuff has been that it's excited people about photography again, which is a great thing. But for the professional, I think digital was one of the best things and one of the worst things to ever happen. I mean, digital is okay. I've been shooting digital since, I don't know, 90, 91. First cameras they came out with big Kodak packs on. Oh, yeah. It was a DCS-1 or something. I don't remember an yeah, F5 body, I think, or it was even an F100 body that was just totally borged out. The first camera that Kodak made literally came with a suitcase that you had to wear on your hip. Mm -hmm. It was an old Nikon camera with a big cable coming out of it. This was long before they actually made a real working model. And then when I was there, the DCS cameras came out, and the 1 and the 3, and they were about $15,000, and the quality was horrible, but the concept was there, and you knew that, okay, this is going to have an application. But it wasn't until the second round of cameras came out where most people said, okay, now this is actually functional. I think digital is a very interesting thing, but I think there's a real upside to it. And obviously, by looking at the state of the industry today, I think that it's hard to deny that not exactly all positive when it comes to what it's done, oh, special photography. I'm happy shooting a 1DS Mark III, a D3, but then I'm also more happy when I can grab a Mamiya C220 or my 6x9 Fuji rangefinder, or a Blad. I don't care what it is. The more archaic, the better. 
Yep. Anymore, I'm almost the cruder the better. I mean, Sunday I spent part of the day shooting pinhole instant with 3000 ISO Fuji pack film. Yeah, the thing is to me as a <laughs> photographer, you should be aware of all of this. You don't necessarily have to use it, but it's really great. And what I've never understood about photographers is the line in the sand. People who just draw the line and say, you should be using A, B, and C. And what's weird is that there's a lot of these guys and gals out there, and I've never really understood that. I mean, I look at the photographers that I love in history, and no one really was dictating to them. I mean, am I going to go to Sebastio Salgado and say, what, dude, you're just not cutting it with this Leica stuff or your Pentax. I think you really have to be shooting digital. No, it's absurd. Nobody looks at Salgado and says that. You look at his work. That's all that matters. He's by far the world's premier documentary photographer and has been for decades. No one questions him. But yet, like I said, my generation of photographers was sort of told this is the direction that you have to go. But for me, like I said, I love it for certain things. I have to put a presentation together for a book company that I have to give next week. And it doesn't make any sense for me to shoot this on film. It needs to be digital because I need to immediately be able to build the presentation. So you just use whatever fits the scenario. Yeah, but think about this, Daniel. If you were at home, you could shoot it, you could develop it, run it through the Nikon scanner, and just a quickie strip deal, and you'd have as good as digital. <laughs> but the problem is it really has to be color. Yeah, yeah, well, oh. then you got a problem. Then well, there's always product. Walgreens. I think they have Walgreens in L.A. You can always go to the corner store and have it pumped out real quick. <laughs> I'm inherently lazy. I'm looking for the path of least resistance here. Yeah, that's true. So, Daniel, you're doing all these great projects, but I think is what's really cool with you being a hybrid photographer, you're into, of course, still doing fiber prints and all this great black and white work, but you're doing books, you're working with Blurb. Tell me about this process that lets the common man publish. Even three or four or five years ago, this would never have happened. Tell me about your experience with Blurb and what you've been doing with making these great books. Well, I think the ideal day for me is to spend the morning in the dark room making black and white silver prints, and then in the afternoon, I come home and I make a book. That, to me, it doesn't get any better. But my sort of fascination with books started a long time ago. I remember when I told you when I got that very first Vivitar camera, the first thing that I did was I literally edited a theme of photos from all these little snapshots I had, and I made a book, which it took me years to remember actually doing that, but now it's very clear. I started making books years ago, back when I was in the newspaper world, and I realized I didn't want to be a newspaper photographer anymore. I wanted to be a magazine photographer. And I had gone to New York to show my work around, and at the time, the way that you showed work was a single page of slides. 20 slides, clear sheet, went into the editor. But what I realized in New York was that none of these editors had a loop or a light table. They were all holding up my slide page to, like, desk lamps, and then they could barely see the work, and no one was really paying attention to the work. And I thought, there has to be a better way of showing this stuff. So I went back to the newspaper, and I asked the guys in the design department, I said, hey, how do I make my own magazine? And they said, oh, you can't, you're crazy, get out of here. And so over a period of about three months, I figured out, I went to the photo lab, they couldn't do it, I went around, and I finally found a Reaper graphics house with a young guy in the back who said, look, I don't know how to do it either, but I really like your work, so let's work together and we'll try to make this thing. And what came out of it three months later was 10 copies of an oversized magazine slash book. And that really was what got me motivated because I took those 10 copies and I mailed them to 10 editorial clients that I never expected to hear from, including the National Geographic and German Geo. And the photo editor of the Geographic at the time wrote me a handwritten full-page letter and said, we don't know what this is, this portfolio, but we've never seen it before. And it's really fantastic. And so I knew that I was moving in the right direction. And fast forward to today, I'm actually on the advisory board of Blurb, which is a print-on-demand book publishing company based in San Francisco. And I've made about 75 books with them, most of which have been for private clients. And then there's about eight books that I sell publicly through their bookstore and then also when I'm doing shows and showing work and things like that. So somebody described me the other day as a serial bookmaker. And I thought that has a good ring to it. In my mind, having the ability to make my own book has been the single most interesting and fun development of the whole digital revolution. Way better than digital capture, any of that stuff. I can now sort of exist in my own publishing world. So let's talk about your experience with Blurb. You're using their templates. Are you laying stuff out yourself in InDesign and Photoshop? Tell me your sort of workflow with the Blurb program. My workflow is all the above. I use their templates. In fact, right before you called me, I pulled images for two books that I have to do tomorrow. 
And for those books, I will use strictly the templates for both books. But the book I did yesterday for another client, I used the templates for the book, but I did the cover in Photoshop. The cover had to have a little bit more flair to it. It had to have a couple of different layers and a different look to it. So I did that in Photoshop and then just imported it. But their software, which is getting more and more sophisticated, is actually pretty good. And what my first admission and what I realized a long time ago is I'm not a designer. I'm a photographer. So when it comes to issues of design, and book design is something that I've learned a lot about in the last year and how specific and how difficult it is to do a really well-designed book. So when it comes to issues that I'm really uncertain of or if it's a book that I really need design, I actually work with a designer. But in a lot of these cases, they're just photographic books for clients. And I learned a long time ago that the best thing for me to do was just to keep things very simple. I think if your photos are really good, there needs to be very little design. I make very clean, very simple books that are primarily a tight edit on the photographs and then pictures displayed prominently. And have you found that your clients like to have these books done? So let's say you do a commission for a portraiture set with a couple kids, maybe the whole family. They dig these books? Almost every shoot I do now has a book. Wow. Yeah, the books have become far more important than even print. And the thing for me is, again, because of the way that I'm shooting, I'm not in the field. When I go do a portrait shoot, I'm not shooting hundreds and hundreds of pictures. That's not what I do. I basically am looking for those few pictures that are good enough to hang on the wall. And pictures like that don't come in three and 400 shot sequences. That's just not how it works. So my primary goal is to make those pictures for the wall. But the secondary goal is to remember that the theme of the whole shoot, which is where the book comes in. So typically the portrait shoots end in books. The weddings that I do always have a book. And then all of my documentary projects, whether they're a two-day project or a two-year project, those also end up in book form. But the thing is, I use Blurb for my portfolio book, and I use Blurb for my promotional book. I also use them for Leave Behind and also for my clients. So I use them for basically every application of what I'm doing commercially. Do you find that you're happy with the quality of Blurb? Let's say if you were doing a little portraiture book for a client, for their kids or the whole family, that you might be better off doing it as a traditional album with a C-print? Or do you find that the Blurb book, maybe soft cover or hard cover, fills the need? People are happy with the quality of it, and you don't find that it's degrading your photography to do it with a dry tone or press book compared to a photograph. No, not at all. I think, one, it depends on the style of your work, and two, your client. But my clients really don't buy albums. In fact, in my whole time of doing portraits and weddings, I've made exactly one album in 10 years. When I started doing weddings, I made only prints. I would shoot a wedding with an M6 and a 35 and black and white film and no flash. I would shoot the whole day, the whole thing, with one camera, one lens, black and white. And then I made the edit. I processed my own film. I made the scans, and I made a book of prints. Not a literal book, but like just a package full of prints. But over the years, I literally made one album, and I just looked at it and said, this really isn't me, and I don't think this is really the client. And so it was right about that time that the print-on-demand book started to sort of materialize. So for me, it's the perfect match. And the quality... The books that I sent off yesterday, it's a 50-page book on what Blurb has as a premium paper, which is a 100-pound uncoated stock. It looks fantastic. But at the same time, I'm also trying to make silver prints for the wall at home. Very interesting. So what do you look forward to coming up here in the future? What does Daniel want to do that you haven't been able to do yet? Besides, I mean, of course, it'd be great if Amy brought home an an Emicon would be cool. You get the dark room set back up in the house. But tell me, what does Daniel want to do photography-wise that you haven't been able to do yet? The sad part is, it's actually maybe sad looking at it in one way, but it's great in another, is I don't feel like I've really started photography yet. Really? I feel very fortunate that I've changed my path every four to five years. So the newspaper, then magazine, then Kodak, then weddings, then portraits, that's kept me very fresh in terms of wanting to go out and make pictures. And I really truthfully do not feel in terms of documentary that I've even started yet which is sad because I just turned 40 and the clock is ticking. But, yes, I would love it if Amy came home with an Emicon. That would be very cool. A winning lotto ticket dropped off at my door would also be kind of cool. (laughs) Yep. And world peace right along in there. But for me, it's just the goal that I have is to try to make more pictures for myself and less for other people. And that might sound a little selfish, but the goal is just to be able to make work that's going to last over time. So when I do portraits, I want to really be able to stick to my guns in terms of what style that is. So it's very, very easy today to sort of allow yourself to fall in line with everyone else because we're all being told and all the magazines and all the advertising is saying you should be doing A, B, and C. 
And when you're not doing A, B, and C, sometimes you kind of get that feeling like, oh, maybe I should be doing something else. And so for me, it's, I need to stick to my guns and just continue to really focus on nothing other than trying to make the best possible images I can without anybody else's parameters being applied. This is very cool. So, Daniel, of course, we're going to chat on other episodes here of Inside Analog Photo about shooting with the Leica, doing some other stuff that you're up to. But right now, let's talk about where people can find out about your photography, look at your books, look at your blog, and just enjoy what you're up to. Well, you have three choices. So I have two different websites and a blog. I think the most fun for me is the blog. I think the blog in the future will be a lot more of what I do. The websites I have, I have two live book sites, which is milnerpictures.net and milnerpictures.com. The .com is the portrait site, and the .net is the documentary site. And there's a bunch of work on each site, and also both sites will link you to my blog, which is called Smog Ranch. I absolutely love blogging. I've been doing it for a long, long time. I've kept a written journal for 15 years, so blogging was a natural progression for me. And it's absolutely fantastic to be able to connect with people from all over the world that are reading it. Irrelevant of what I put on there, I put my mother's poetry on there. I put photographs. I put stories about photography. It's fantastic to get responses from people. No, this is great stuff and great work. And Daniel, I appreciate you taking time today. And we definitely look forward to chatting with some more topics coming up here in the future. And I really appreciate it, buddy. Absolutely. I appreciate you having me on. Well, there you go. Daniel Milner, great guy, excellent photography. Definitely check out his website, his blog, beautiful work. And, of course, the Inside Analog Photography Radio Program has been brought to you by Fujifilm over at www.fujifilmusa.com, Richard Photo Lab at richardphotolab.com, DR5, of course, over at dr5.com, and Upstrap at upstrap-pro.com, and our media partners over at www.apug.org. We place on the web for all things analog photography. I've been your host, Scott Shepard, here on Inside Analog Photo. We'll be back next week with more great analog photography.